James Howard Kunstler, it's a pleasure to see you again. Oh, it is a pleasure to see you too. Uh, in the flesh, but really on screen, not, not here in my room. <laughs> well, it's long overdue that uh, we, we speak. And um, hey, before I, before I start, um, uh, is Hillary alive these days? Or, or has they, has she's been, uh, I hear rumors she's been dead. What's happening? Well, she hasn't emerged from her cocoon in the last two days. And, and I don't know, I, I suppose she's alive. They're going to roll her out and uh, wheel her around. And uh, I'm not sure how long she'll last at a, any of the events that she's going to. Uh, two days is not very long to recover from pneumonia, if that's what it was. And, you know, there's a lot of suspicion that it's something more than pneumonia. So it remains to be seen. This is going to be a very kind of interesting and critical couple of weeks. Um, especially with uh, the action in the uh, American Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, uh, coming up in the week of the 29th of September. And, um, uh, you know, what happens and what comes out of that may affect the presidential election and may, uh, you know, end up uh, reflecting poorly on Hillary. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe the Democratic Party is calling the Russians and the Chinese to see how How about embalming techniques that they use for Lenin and Mao that can be used? <laughs> well, that's good. That would be a good idea. How is this uh, election going? Because it seems to me that everybody hates Hillary and everybody hates Trump. Uh, yes. I, I have, in my long life, I have never seen two candidates, two major candidates who are so broadly and deeply disliked. And I think that it's uh, very depressing to a lot of people. And, uh, you know, I personally am not suffering because it affords me a great opportunity for comedy uh, <laughs> in my writing. So I am not depressed, but uh, I'm a little concerned about the fate of the nation because I don't think either of them are really uh, capable. And, and then does it really matter that they are capable at this point? Well, I think it does matter. I, I am not among those who would dismiss the idea that leadership has no meaning or value. I think it does. Um, uh, per, co per corollary, I think you could say that if we had excellent leadership, you know, that would make a difference in the way we conduct uh, our uh, affairs and, and address our problems. But we don't have that either. So uh, uh, it may be that for the moment, events are in charge, not personalities. The um, interesting thing is that uh, as a writer, as well of, as, as a fiction writer, um, you, you, are per you have perceived uh, quite soon the, the, the descent, the long emergency, and indeed the, the, the too much magic that there is uh, around. And uh, don't you feel that in this election, there's a lot of this magic that is being dispelled in the general public? Yes. Uh, in fact, we're hearing very little in the way of... Uh, so-called, you know, techno uh, rescue remedies and solutions to the various problems that we face. There's very little talk about energy in general, uh, you know, uh, uh, oil in particular, but, you know, there, there's almost no discussion about alternative energy and a lot of the delusional thinking that surrounds it, of course. You know, the idea that We're going to run Walt Disney World, Walmart, and the interstate highway system on uh, solar and wind, which is uh, an idea I regard as very fanciful, as you know. Um, so uh, we're not hearing a lot about that, and uh, because Mr. Trump has, sent, has set such a low bar for discussion and, and turned everything into an ad hominem uh, uh, battle or attack, You know, the, the, there's almost no discussion of substance going on at all. It, it's, it's quite appalling. I, you know, we've never seen such a childish and idiotic uh, election campaign in, in my memory. Especially at the time where well, I kind of agree with you, it does matter. Because, you know, one thing that I found that, um, you know, when, when, when Trump says we need to make America great again, in, in, in reality, this is a statement that America is not great anymore. Sure. And, uh, and, and it's a sort of realization, I don't know if it was intended that way, but it's a sort of admitting that um, 
uh, the, the shit is really in the, not about, but in the fan. And, and for all the millions of people who have lost jobs and houses in the last decade, um, there's not real prospects that things are going to improve uh, or at least get back the way it used to be. Yeah, and unfortunately, this idea about making America great again, uh, quotation marks, um, uh, is going to end up disappointing so many people because we're not going to become uh, the America of 1955. No. Detroit is not going to be the Detroit of 1955 again. Uh, so there will be something there, and it may even be a, uh, a human settlement of some importance because of its location on the Great Lakes. But, uh, you know, we're, we're not going back to the middle of the 20th century. It's really a question of uh, what we can salvage out of that period of history. And um, if we can get realistic about uh, going forward with uh, a different set of resources. Now, you, you published recently your fourth and final book of your quadrilogy, uh, of World Made by Hand, uh, The uh, Harrows of Spring, which I finished reading uh, recently, a few days ago. And um, besides the fact that it's superbly well written and, uh, and of course, it closes a very interesting uh, story of the world to come, especially in the region uh, that where, you, where, you, where you live now or for, for, for some years now, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how, how The Harrows of Spring closes in your idea and how, does it, how is it set in the future that you envision for that area of the world where you live? Well, as this series of books developed, I wanted to open up the story. Um, you know, the, the story was set in a small town in a, a, a provincial corner of New York State, rather far away from New York City or uh, any other large city. And um, a lot of the action... Uh, well, there, there was the, the idea that these people were pretty isolated. They weren't getting news about what was going on elsewhere in the country. So by the time the third book came, came along, which was called A History of the Future, I decided to open it up and give readers a glimpse of what had happened in the United States over this period. And uh, I sent one of my characters, a young man, into the heart of America, and what he discovers is that the nation has broken up into several smaller units. There's a, uh, 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 the, the federal, the old federal government has been reduced in size and its, its capital has been moved to a kind of remote corner uh, of the Great Lakes in the Midwest. And um, there's a new breakaway country in the Mid-South that styles itself the... Uh, Foxfire Republic. Uh, it was my idea of kind of a Tea Party fans, uh, a Tea Party fantasy of of what their perfect utopia would be, and um, the Foxfire Republic is led by a woman who used to be a country western singer and a TV evangelist, and uh, she's quite a character. You know, I, I like to refer to her as Dolly Parton meets Hitler. <laughs> What's and, not to like? <laughs> she's also, you know, she, she has a thing for young men, too. Yeah, what's which, not to like? <laughs> well, yeah, which is one of, the, one of the ways that my character, you know, gets inside of her, her world and, and uh, eventually carries out a mission against her, shall we say. So uh, th there's that. The, the Foxfire Republic, we learn, is at war with another breakaway country, which is basically... Uh, uh, the the deep South states, the old Dixieland states of Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama, and they style themselves as New Africa, and they've become kind of a breakaway black nation, and they're at war with the Foxfire people, and so that's what's going on there. So, you know, the villains in that book were generally, you know, the right wingers, the uh, the ultra hyper conservatives, you know that I, I was trying to portray maybe the, you know the end result of that venture. So in the Harrows of Spring, the fourth book, I decided to go in the other direction and portray the villains as the new cultural uh, Marxists, the social justice warriors of the 
American campuses and, and uh, you know, the, the worst elements of what uh, liberalism has evolved into in our time, which is a very despotic ideology that wants to basically shut down free speech and push everybody around and tell them what to think. So the, um, uh, my little town of Union Grove, New York, is being invaded by this ragtag army of social justice warriors from uh, Massachusetts. And what they're really there for is to uh, swindle them out of their silver in exchange for paper uh, dollars that they, uh, you know, that they have issued in their own little country. So, I, you know, I basically wanted to uh, play the full spectrum of political idiocy in America uh, from the extreme right wing to the extreme left wing and uh, get them all in there. And I think that I think I accomplished it pretty well. I can see yes, and and I can see that what is quite pleasing in in these four books now that they they all fit together is that the first one, a world made by hand, was very slow. It had a very slow pace, and it made sense because clearly uh, in a in a in a much reduced and collapsed world, you you don't have the fast life of of today. You 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 have. Uh, food to get on your table, that's your main priority for, for, for every day. And therefore, the, the, the relationship with your very close neighbors are so important, if perhaps boring by our point of view of today's super fast world. Now, as, as this story, the pace does accelerate, book after, one book after the other. And of course, I presume this is what you wanted. Now, um, Uh, I presume you want to close these stories at, at four books, or perhaps in the future you'll have uh, some, some, some... I some... wanted to write a book for every season of the yes. year. And, you know, the action of all four books takes place over one year, and I wanted it to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a balanced and kind of symmetrical, elegant, uh, formal work. Yeah, they're, they're really... It's a, it's, I think it's a must-have. Any, anyone who's interested but in fiction, but also interested about how the world may look like in, in, in the United States, which I think should be about 320 million people in the U.S. that should be interested about your books. Uh, that's what I hope for you, is you sell one to each of them. Yeah. Um, it, it's, these books are a must-have. Now, when, while I was reading these books, I couldn't help asking myself a question, which I want to ask you, is, is this, in, in difficult times, Or as we are getting into difficult times and people are realizing, and we started a discussion with the election process, people start to become uh, fearful, anxious. And we know that managing fear and anxiety is one of the things the body is not m perfectly made for. We are, we are engineered to manage the very short-term fear of having a big cat trying to eat us but not the long-term stress that today's world uh, is uh, putting on us, but also not this kind of fear of the future that I don't think is very common in, or certainly recent in, uh, in world history. So as, as you're one of the few people who, foreseen, who has foreseen this fall that we are in the middle of and, and only at the beginning of, how did you, did you experience fear and anxiety yourself about the future? And if so, how did you cope with that? It's a big question. Yes. First of all, I might disagree with you a little bit about historically uh, how humans have uh, processed or managed fear. Because remember, if you go back 500 years or 1,000 years, uh, you have a great deal of anxiety about the afterlife. Oh, yeah. And about, you know the religious management of uh, uh, the human condition, and that I actually regard you know the Middle Ages uh, in Europe as being a tremendously fearful and anxious period, uh, and largely because of the memory of the collapse of the Roman Empire, which I think had a very very long lasting effect on the psyche, the collective psyche of Europe. Well, that said, there's no question that um, uh, an extreme amount of anxiety is very hard for is very hard on the human spirit and the human body. Um, 
I had quite a bit of experience with this as a young person. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in fact, I have been writing a series of essays over the years, which I intended to publish as a book, which I uh, have, which has the working title "Young Man Blues: Notes on a Nervous Adolescence," because I was a very fearful uh, and anxiety-ridden adolescence and young adult. Well, I think one of the advantages of that is I got it out of the way early in life. You know, if, if there is a time that uh, a person maybe uh, ought to be fearful, you know, it's that point where you're emerging into adulthood, trying to develop your autonomy as an adult, and floundering around a bit, as many of us do. And that was my experience. And I you know, I had uh, what would be clinically called, you know, an anxiety problem and an anxiety disorder when I was a teenager and a young man. Um, I eventually got over it. I think part of it had to do with simply my the development of my brain. You know, they say that in young uh, men especially, the portion of the brain that is responsible for judgment uh, doesn't develop until about age 25. So, you know, you, you go out into the world when you're 21 years old and you're really not that well equipped to navigate through the, the early uh, travails and, and problems of uh, making a career and, um, you know, establishing your, your adult skills. So that was my experience. But I think what I discovered as a result of all that was that... Uh, there's nothing more important uh, than leading a, a purposeful life on a daily basis and taking care of your own business and, and um, doing it effectively. And, uh, you know, that, that has worked for me over time. And when, it, when I came to the time in my life when I was dealing with large questions that, that uh, disturbed people, I had uh, constructed a life for myself that gave me a lot of um, uh, a lot of nourishment and fortification and satisfaction and pleasure and meaning. And you know, the construction of a purposeful life must be thought of by by uh, an adult person as a deliberate construction project. And, and you go about it carefully. For example, in my, in my personal experience, um, when I was a young man, I was a journalist. And I worked for uh, big newspapers. And so uh, I was a journalist and I, I, I was working for corporations. And um, uh, I knew that if I wanted to... Uh, get beyond that, I would have to make some serious tactical decisions. So I had a pretty glam, I had a glamour job at Rolling Stone magazine. It was a place where a lot of young journalists wanted to be. And I wasn't particularly happy there. Uh, I actually had enjoyed working for a regular newspaper in a, you know, in, in a much smaller city, um, much more than that job. But uh, I knew I had to quit and, and write books. Uh, back, back then, the programming for a young man was to write novels in the 1970s, if you had any literary ambitions. So I very deliberately dropped out, and uh, I, I drove a motorcycle across the country from San Francisco to uh, the, back to the East Coast, and I picked a town to settle down in and, and become a starving bohemian and write my books and, you know, find a way to do it. <clears throat> As it happened, I think I, I made a good choice. I moved to a small town called Saratoga Springs, a population of about 30,000. And uh, it was a very nourishing place. You know, I, I, I deliberately uh, constructed a social network for myself. I made a lot of friends. Um, I fell into a working rhythm of writing my books. Uh, I was able to live there with, you know, relatively little money. And as a result, you know, I published one book after another for years. So 
what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, constructing a life for yourself that, that's meaningful and purposeful has to be thought of as a deliberate construction project and, and gone about pretty seriously. Um, you know, one of the pitfalls of choosing to be a writer is that it, it um, uh, uh, entails a lot of disappointment. You know, you get rejected and, you know, people don't want to pay you for your work. And after all, the world has not asked for this work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're just doing it and putting it out there. But, you know, I, I discovered some interesting things and I came to some interesting conclusions and developed some uh, cardinal laws uh, for, for my own conduct and for uh, human social relations. You know, one, one thing I discovered is that perseverance counts more than talent. There are a lot of talented people out there who can write well, but if they can't hang in there against the gales and storms of disappointment, you know, then their talent doesn't matter. So you have to be able to withstand a lot of uh, frustration and um, adversity. Uh, another thing that I learned, which I call Kunstler's First Law of Social Relations, is as follows. Uh, out of every room with 100 people in it, 99 of them think they're the only ones who don't have their shit together. Okay, meaning just about everybody, uh, just about every human being is insecure. Mm -hmm. and, and to develop the idea that everybody else is doing so much better than you are, you know, uh, little you with your anxiety and your fears and your, your insecurities, you know, to, to develop the idea that everybody else doesn't have that, is a very unrealistic way to view the world. And, and once you realize that, it allows you to navigate through life a lot, with, you know, a lot more easily. And to get along with people better because, you know, you appreciate the fact that everybody has a hard time in life. Everybody does. So then we come to the question of, you know, how do I uh, uh, operate happily and freely with the uh, subjects that I've been treating in my recent books, you know the the uh, what I what we call this, the converging catastrophes of of the modern um, world, whether it is uh, the uh, resource problems that we face with peak oil, which by the way is still a serious problem despite the the uh, the memes out there which yeah. would suggest that it's over. It's not over. You know, in fact, we're just heading into the heart of it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the problems that, that are related to that with banking, money, finance, and, you know, really the uh, kind of the circulatory system of modern economies. Um, the problems we face with uh, uh, population, uh, with uh, disease, um, with our uh, 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 ecological destruction, um, you know, probably in one form or another with uh, climate change, whichever way it ends up going, and we're not quite sure yet where it is going. Um, and um, so, you know, I grappled with these things. I, I must say that I, I was not curled up in the fetal position in a closet as a result of it, uh, um, I, I felt very interested in these things. I wasn't disabled by it. Um, and after I wrote The Long Emergency, which is a kind of a heavy book, as people used to say, heavy, you know, um, um, I embarked on, the, on those four World Made by Hand novels. And part of the reason I wrote it was to depict this, the future world as a place that would actually be kind of comfortable. You know, it might be, uh, 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 you know, it would have some hardship, but on the whole, um, there would be a lot of appeal in that world. And so when I contemplate the future, especially in my country, and I think about what it's going to feel like to live in it, and, you know, what the practical matters of existence are going to be, you know, I feel a lot of kind of serene reassurance that it's not going to be that bad. <clears throat> it could be very different, 
but not really necessarily terrible. Um, and I also take a lot of comfort in the idea that if we let go of many of the comforts and conveniences of our time, especially all the digital crap, you know, the, the iPhones and the email and, you know, all the annoying connectivity. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't have pneumonia like Hillary Clinton. <clears throat> it's contagious. Uh, if, if we let go of all that, you know, and actually have to uh, uh, live a more vividly present life with the people around us and the the tasks at hand that we actually have to do to get by day by day, you know, I think we might be much happier people. What do you do day to day um, <clears throat> to manage any anxiety? I see, I see you have weights on the table. You, you exercise, you, 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 uh... I do exercise. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to be 68 years old in a few weeks and um, I'm in pretty good shape. I've had some medical adventures in recent years, but on the whole, you know, I think, uh, you know, I'm pretty trim and pretty strong and I do a lot. I have a lot of energy and um, <clears throat> I uh, walk probably five days a week, a couple of miles and I bike about 10 miles uh, two or three times a week. And uh, in the winter, you know, I go into the gym and uh, I do that. Yeah, I, I think uh, basically I lead a pretty orderly life. You know, I, for me, um, routines are important because I don't have a boss. I don't have anybody pushing me around or telling me what to do. You know, I'm totally responsible for getting my shit done. And so, you know, I, I have to make sure that I, I erect a, you know, a structure for myself in, in my life that works and that works, makes me happy. So, um, <clears throat> I don't overwork myself. Kurt Vonnegut once said, nobody can be intelligent for more than five hours a day. And, uh, I don't push myself much harder than that to actually concentrate on the work at hand but you know I do other things I I have a, a lot I have a big garden here you know you've seen this place I have a lot of yes. fruit trees and and things that I have to take care of so that gets me out it gets me active um, I, I still consider my social network to be important and you know I work to to keep it important you, you know what that means is <clears throat> you have to cook dinner for your friends a few times a month Are you, you're, you're a good cook, by the way. Oh, thanks. But if you don't do that, you won't see your friends. So, uh, you know, especially in this, in this age in America where there's very little public space, yeah. people don't leave their houses. Yeah. You know, they, they might go to their computer to look at the, uh, you know, the drudge report and see what's going on in the world. But where I live, and I live in a small town. Now, I moved about 15 miles east of Saratoga Springs to this small town. It's a former factory village that had maybe four or five small factories in it um, before 1960. They're all gone. Um, uh, I, I'm not even sure what many of the people in this town do. I, I think quite a few of them are on government support. Uh, you know, many of them are uh, old because the young people have fled. And uh, we don't even have a um, bistro or a bar. Uh, we, we have a, a restaurant, but we don't have a, you know, a bar or a cafe in this town. So there's no place to hang out. And um, so, you know, life in America is very different from life in Europe. And uh, you have to work very hard to see people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. everybody's just cocooning in their house. Now, this, this uh, I think, presents a problem for how people are going to relearn, they'll have to relearn how to function in a social setting because um, they've been taken out of the social setting for a couple of generations now. They're not used to seeing other people. I mean, unless you live in New York or Boston or, or Washington or San Francisco, you know, you don't see other people. That's quite so, unique. That, I think, has never happened in history. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you go to Europe. I go to Europe and I, I see the way people live there and... Uh, it just amazes me that 
our public life in America is as impoverished as it is. Mm -hmm. It's shocking to come back from Stockholm or Paris or or uh, Florence and 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 discover that there's absolutely no place to go at five o'clock in the town where you live. And but that's the way it is in America. We're you know like a lot of other things. There's a price that we're going to have to pay for that. And I suppose the price is that. Uh, it will be very difficult for us to relearn how to do these things. Just like in the former Soviet Union, you know, they didn't have uh, shopping for 75 years. And they really didn't know how to do it. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, they had to learn how to do you know, retail shopping all over again. And they weren't very good at it. You know, the, the, the few people who had worked in Soviet stores... We're just used to pushing people around and abusing them. And they had to learn the hard way that you actually have to be nice to people if you want to succeed in business. And it took them a few years to get the hang of that. So, uh, you know, we'll see how that works in America with our extremely antisocial um, uh, conditions of the moment. Now, you, you've encountered over the years many of your readers, and, and let's, let's not take those who are... Who are, who are in denial, but those who understood the, the premises of your books and, and, and how the world seems to be going, um, how do they seem, do they come to you about uh, saying I'm scared and um, what was, what's their um, reaction from the people you meet and see and, and, and what do you advise them? Uh, if, if well, they... I do actually get a lot of uh, mail from readers And I do speak to a lot of people about these things. I've not seen your hate mail list anymore. You, you've removed it from your site, right? You, oh, well, you, yeah, you I, I, I redid my, my website about three years ago, and somehow that got lost in the shuffle. You, you had know. a very funny list of hate yeah. em emails. I'm, I'm sure I haven't you, gotten so much of it lately. Yeah, I think people are, um, are accepting this. Good. Yeah. So sorry, I interrupted you. But uh, I, do get, I do talk to people about this issue that you raise, and uh, I get a lot of mail from people. And I would say that there is a detectable underlying uh, strain of anxiety that uh, is underneath the, all the frivolity of uh, you know, daily life and, and the superficial social interactions. I think a lot of people are aware... Uh, of uh, the insecurity that we face. And uh, in the USA especially, there's an underlying sense of unease in America. But a lot of this has to do with the, a lot of the practical uh, things of existence in, in the United States, which are really beginning to uh, affect people's lives. For example, our uh, health care system is so bad Um, it has become such a matrix of racketeering and money grubbing that people are afraid to go to the doctor, not because of what they're going to find out about their body, but because of what's going to happen to them financially. You know, they end up in a hospital and they have this, uh, uh, you know, bad insurance that uh, it has a $5,000 deductible ceiling to it. And, you know, and they end up with a bill for $5,000 for a broken finger, right? Uh, you go into the emergency room with a, a rather inconsequential injury, and all of a sudden, you know, you, you have uh, four figures of debt that, that you pay. And, and, and it's strictly racketeering. I mean, they, it's a hostage racket, literally, mm -hmm. because they have you at a weak moment when you're injured or, or ill, And then they work their hoodoo on you. And I think this makes people extremely nervous. The job insecurity issue is another problem. You know, people working for corporations that treat them like bananas where they, you know, they peel them, they eat them, and they throw the skin away in the garbage. And uh, so they treat people like banana skins and they just throw them away. Um, they, they have uh, very little uh, security With that, and and there's I, I think a certain knowledge that if you're over 50 years old, you may be unemployable for the rest of your life because nobody wants to take you uh, on. 
So there's that. And there's the general, what, what we've already discussed, the general um, isolation and alienation of the way American life is arranged on the landscape. You know, the fiasco of suburbia, the isolation of people being stuck in their cars for hours every day and having no place to go to meet anybody or to be with people other than their family. And, you know, your family cannot be everything to you. You need more than your family to function as an adult in this world. You need other relationships. You need friend relationships. You need mentors. You need uh, uh, elder advisors. You need to be around people younger than you. You need to be around people of all kinds. And um, this is very hard to find in America for people. And they're kind of locked in isolation with their families. And they end up not getting enough out of that, and then the family relations deteriorate because they take it out on their wife and their children. So there's a lot uh, in, in contemporary Amer American life and in m the modern condition um, to make it difficult for people to function. And, um, and I hear about that, and I, and I detect it affecting people very badly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think the bottom line is this, that there are going to be a lot of people who are poorly prepared for the hardships and difficulties that lie ahead, um, and uh, uh, probably, you know, a, a surprisingly small number of people are going to have the fortitude to get through this. Yeah. It's uh, somewhat something like uh, I've seen in Eastern Europe when it collapsed in the early 90s. A lot of people, especially people of the older generation who had committed to the system they, that was the socialist system that they knew, um, were completely lost when suddenly it, was, um, uh, it, it went from very socialist to capitalist on steroids. And, um, and a lot of them uh, killed themselves by alcoholism, by drinking. A lot of yeah. them were completely lost, and they expected the state to solve every problem. The state was non-existent. Um, they were lost. They were really lost. And uh, the, the countries, uh, Orlov writes very well about how the family, the people who had strong family connection, coped much better than those who didn't. And um, it's, it's going to be very difficult. Well, we already see in America that uh, the American public uh, looks very bad. They look sick. They look ill. They look unhappy. And the reason for that is very simple. You know, their lifestyle is killing them. Mm. They're eating very bad food. They're, they're eating all kinds of processed food crap. Um, the rates of obesity in America are just staggering. And, and the diseases that accompany that, you know, uh, and, you know, you, you go into... Uh, one of the few public places that we have in America, the supermarket. And more than half of the people you see in there are going to be uh, uh, not well looking. You know, in fact, the people who you could probably, if you had any skill as a diagnostician, you could very easily um, describe the, the diseases that they suffer from. So, um, that's going to be a big problem in and of itself that, um, you know, the American public is already so sick that they may have uh, poor prospects for survival. Mm -hmm. There was even a story in the newswires today about the obesity in the uh, military, in the U.S. Yes. military. Yes, I've, I've read that. Because, you know, they, they have a certain pool of people to choose from. And, and the, those people who tend to be the lower income people are the people who have been eating the, the worst diet and, and uh, the people who have been putting on the most uh, weight. And, and so they've been lowering their standards and, and letting more and more you know, enormous people into the military. Well, at least, at least now they can get uh, uh, transvestites in the military. So, so you're safe. Yeah. Um, on that's, a, um, that's a real improvement. <laughs> yeah, but, the, you know, it's interesting that the we... Russians are scared. Yeah, right. It's interesting that we, we take so much comfort in these phony uh, achievements of, you know, uh, allowing uh, transsexuals in the military as though that's going to make a, 
a better military, you know? Yeah. All, all it is is a way for people to feel that they're morally superior, yeah. you know, really by, by being so broad-minded. But it's, it's really not a very good idea, in my opinion. Linked to that is, um, is something you made me aware when I first read your, your, your books uh, uh, almost a decade ago, is the epidemic of tattoos. And uh, I think you and I share this um, uh, question mark about why people try, try to, to be different by being all the same, having lots of tattoos, uh, especially warrior and tribe-like tattoos where their lives are, in fact, very dull. And, and, uh, and yeah. um, what's your take on that? You see, I think it's very much related to what you just said. Well, uh, one of the features of, of American life anyway, is that we're addicted to images and especially television. And what I've noticed, especially about the new style of tattoos, is that often you have people struggling to tell some kind of a life story all over their body, you know, uh, and, and it ends up looking very disordered and very uh, fragmentary. You know, like this is my experience when I was 23 years old being, uh, you know, uh, in, in Iraq. And this is my experience now. Uh, it's a picture of my four-year-old daughter. And this is, uh, you know, the romance that I had when I was 17 and never forgot. But it's just a bunch of disordered images that, that are flashing before the viewer like uh, the images in the preview of coming attractions that you see in the movies, you know, where they change the image every half second. So uh, there's a kind of attention deficit disease that is displayed in these tattoos that don't really add up to anything. And then there are the tribal ones like, you know, the, the Celtic warrior swirls and bands and ninja tattoos and things, which are an attempt uh, for people who lead dull lives, as you say, to pretend that they're warriors, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, the whole thing is, is a kind of an empty exercise in self-presentation to make you, to try to convince yourself and other people that you're something that you're not. I'm, I'm scared to say that it's, it's, it's very pathetic because there's so many around, I will be beaten up by, by when they will gang up on me just for hearing this. But Well, um, you know, what's even worse is to see it on the old ladies in, 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 up here in the provinces where it's become a fad for, for you know, women of a certain age to get these ridiculous, enormous tattoos on their arms and they get sleeves. Or on and, the you belts know, or on the breasts. Yes, it's... It, and uh, it's very disturbing to see that in a, in a 60 year old woman, you know, it has no decorum, it has no dignity, it, it, you know, it's undignified. And, and we are becoming more and more a nation of undignified savages and barbarians. So don't start this with Gerald Chalente. <laughs> he, he, will, okay. he will rant on this for half an hour. But yeah. um, but you're right. It's um, but it's a symptom. It's a very interesting symptom of how <coughs> we've been um, lost as as societies. I can tell you, it's the same here in Europe, and um, and how we struggle through these pathetic means. Um, and in a way, it's touching because it's 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 a sign of trying to hold on something that. But it's, it's obviously an illusion because even if you have tattoos, it doesn't mean you have real bonds. You're, as you know, in the old days, people who had tattoos were gang members or prison, prison inmates or, or member of some military who, who showed bonding, bonding, not bondage, bonding by having the same tattoos. Or like the, the mafia in Russia still have uh, very particular tattoos and they will actually skin you if you have the same and you haven't been part of the same experience as yeah. they did. So or the yakuza in, in Japan, exactly, and so it's a kind of recreating these these tribal bonds, which um, unfortunately don't don't exist anymore, and that people are desperate for belonging to that. Too. And uh, it's in a way it's pathetic, but it's also touching. It's also, um, and and we have to say to people that it looks good on them. Otherwise, otherwise we look like uh, we are uh, we are bad people. <laughs> I don't say that. What I say is marron. 
<laughs> yeah, it's some of that. Well, James, thank you very much for, for these um, thoughts. I think that uh, indeed managing our, our, ourselves, whether it's uh, physically but also psychologically, is definitely something that we need to learn. And, and you and I are, are living days through living in the, in the countryside with chick. I hope your chickens are doing well. Yeah, I got three more oh, about uh, uh, earlier in the week. I got three new ones. Uh, uh, I lost three to uh, from death from above. Uh, you know, from the, above. the hawks and the owls got them. Uh, but I had two left, and I got three new ones. So the, with the chickens and the the uh, the garden and the, the 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 fruit trees and 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 keeping in shape and having good food and. As best as we as we all can, of course, and um, and 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 at the same time having our minds, as you described, prepared, uh, flexible, fast thinking, uh, to 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 and not not hold on on something that is disappearing anyway. We have to think of something new. And this is why, by the way, to to close the loop on wh where we started, the politics that try to to hold on something that is either mythical or something that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, is is also pathetic in a way, and and uh, yeah. and I think people, as you write in too much magic, people will will be extremely disappointed when when this thing is proven not to be uh, not to be true anymore. Yeah. Well, with that, thank you very much for your time, and um, we'll see you soon. <laughs> thank is you very much.